talking about a process. Um, I, uh, I got up this week and I was late one morning and, and I had two kids. Anybody battled the flu this week? Is it only my kids? It's all of us. We've all got the flu. Everybody in here, if you hadn't got the flu and you see somebody raising your hand, thank them because you will have it tomorrow. Amen? That's how it is. So I was, I was uh, if, if Kara can get ready here, uh, I, uh, I was doing Pictionary with the kids. And one thing about me is I, I'm not overly competitive. I'm the right amount of competitive, but I think I'm creative and can draw a little bit. And my son is seven and my daughter is four, so we're playing Pictionary. And I'm drawing this on this dry erase board, and I'm thinking, guess what? This is going to be I'm knocking it out of the park because it's a fireman. I can draw a fireman because I can draw a hydrant, and I can draw a hose, and I can draw a guy with a hat, right? Putting out a funny flame. I, it's in the bag. You know what I'm saying? It's in the bag. I got this. Now, it, my son said, Dad, I want to draw for our team. Okay. Okay. As, you know, okay. Here you go. Let him draw. And this is what he came up with. And if you can get this, I'm going to buy you a Big Mac. Jesus. Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll take some answers. Okay, monkey bars. The fireman. Jesus. Uh, okay. Hey, I asked. A guy swimming? Uh, yeah, that's right. Daniel. Tyro. Patrick. Jump off a dime board. You! It's you, isn't it? It's... No, sir, it's not me. Go. Okay. okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Because, you know, when I saw this, I thought to myself, what card are you reading? Because, you know, everything's on the card. You kind of pick it. You know, Pictionary. And so I thought to myself, what in the world? And then... And then Malachi said, well, well, Dad, it's it's a guy hanging Christmas cards. <laughs> Obviously, it's a guy hanging Christmas cards. Show the next picture. The whole time, my son isn't reading the cards. He's looking at what's behind him, and he's saying, this is what I'm drawing because this is what I'm seeing. And this is where this gets real realistic. You know, a lot of times we don't understand God's process because it looks like the first picture. It's squiggly and we don't quite understand. And the whole time God is saying, listen, bro, I've got you because I see a year from now. I see 10 years from now. I know what you're going through because I'm allowing you to go through it. Amen. I see the finished product. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say he's just getting started. He's just getting started. He's just getting started. There's something we don't understand about that. The process tonight I would like to I would like to share a few thoughts with you and it's going to be very simple but it's something that we have missed in church if you claim to be a follower in in Christ a believer in Christ there's something that the majority of us have missed up until this point so it's very very important that we lock it in and what it is that the Lord is is saying through Scripture what's your goal for 2020 I, I think about that, and, and, and for, for some of you guys, it was it was it was around school, and it was different things, and you got to make the bread, as the one young man say. I got to get my life together in certain things. But I will tell you that there is a word that is more important in following Christ than meeting the goal. Because if I were to ask you what is the goal in Christianity, many of your hands would say what salvation, to be saved, right? Why? Because every time on a Wednesday night, this is how we wrap it up. I'm going to show you what we're going to do in about 10 minutes from now. I'm going to say, is there anybody here that would like to give their heart to the Lord? It's a special moment. And I want to explain something to you. I want to explain the process of what God does in your life. Because many of you guys have got it badly confused. And it worries me. And so we've got to correct the problem. Amen? That's what we're going to do. I'm going to help you tonight. I'm going to do for you what was not done to, for me at this age. I didn't understand this. There's a process involved. And the process is more important than the goal. So the goal can never be salvation. Salvation is just the foundation from which God builds His process on. Did, did you hear the scripture? It said that the foundation was built for the temple of God, but it was just getting started. Up until the present day, it is still being worked on. And this is why you've got to understand, can I be saved and then still feel the same way I did before? Absolutely. Yeah. There has men and women in this house tonight that said, I don't get it. I've given my heart to the Lord, but yet I went back to the same bedroom the very same night and felt the very same way. Absolutely. 
It's possible. I'm going to take it one step further. A lot of people don't like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it because I know it to be true. Can I live a sorry, mediocre life and still be saved? Yes. Absolutely. Why? Because you missed out on the process and you went straight to the goal and you thought it was the end. Yeah. You thought it was the end. You've got the wrong goal in mind. I, 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 want to, I want to tell you something because it, I'm so passionate about what I'm about to say that it will change the way that you look at following Christ. Getting saved at the altar is it is instantaneously a, a, a commitment. At, at that moment, the Word of God says this. You've heard me say this many times. But for some of you guys that have never heard this, I want to say this very clearly. The Word of God says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe in your heart that He was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. Hey, guess what? We do that. That's why we say the prayer. The prayer is not in the Bible. Matter of fact, sometimes I make up the prayer, but it goes along with those same lines so that you're expressing something externally of what Christ is doing internally. That's it. That's not the goal. So oftentimes we'll say the prayer and we'll get up from the altar and we'll go back on the bus and we make it home. We go back to the bedroom and we close the door and we feel all alone once again. Why? Because that was never the goal. That was just the beginning. So this is where it gets good. It, it, it should have already gotten good because if you understand where you are now is not where God is wanting to bring you. And if you understand my life is not great now and I thought it was going to be so much better if I, if I put it in the hands of God, I, I want you to understand it can be. You, you haven't even scratched the surface of what God is trying to do. That, that's really the good news tonight. We, we, we haven't looked at this correctly because there's a process Tonight there's a word in, in the process that I, I'd like to share. And my wife is going to show you a, a picture. And the word that we skip over oftentimes that is part of the process that is, is so incredibly important. But before we do that, I want to say one more thing about salvation. Because this is something that as a pastor I cannot mess up. This is something that the Word of God says, I will be judged for what I'm about to say. So I want to say this very clearly. The moment that you give your heart to the Lord, you believe Him, you ask for forgiveness, you are saved. Does everybody understand that? I'm not saying that you are not saved. I am not saying that your sins have not been forgiven, that they have not been whitewashed, that God chooses to forget, forget them. Right? Has the best case of amnesia. I heard a pastor say that. Never forgot that. But I am saying that's not where it is over. And that's where we get messed up. Everybody understand? I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you're not forgiven. Never will I say that. Show the first picture, please. Part of the process that we don't get into and that we don't start to do is we never surrender. This is the most important part after leaving this position, after saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a God. I know that you defeated death on my behalf. I know that you hung upon a cross and you shed your blood on Calvary for me. I understand my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I thank you for saving my soul. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. And I will get up. And I will walk out and I will either get in my own personal car or I'll get in a van or I'll get in a bus and I'll go back home. And we've totally missed the beginning of the process. First point, surrender. The first point, surrender. Hey, boy, uh, these, this row right here, well, let's separate them real quick. It's too important. It's too important for me not to take the time to correct because there's people in the back row and there's people over here. They've got to hear this. Surrender. So what's that mean? Let me, let me tell you what the Word of God means. And if you need a Bible at the end of the night, come see me because it's very important. It says this, Matthew 16, verse 24. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You have to lose something that you currently have to receive something that Jesus Christ is currently offering through the payment of the cross. Right? Okay, we don't like that word surrender. 
When I said that word surrender, we don't like that word because this is what we see. How, how many guys, I, I, Jaron's been watching military movies, right? He, he's into that stuff. Anybody like military movies? Who likes the military movie where the guy comes out of the foxhole, he comes behind the sandbags, and he raises the white flag? Does anybody like that? No. We like the guy that says, I'm going down in a blaze of glory, and I'm going to take as many opposing enemies as I, as I can, right? That, that, that's what we like. That's what we watch. That's a box office hit. We have the wrong idea of surrender when it comes to Jesus Christ. We, we have messed this up. We don't understand it completely. Surrender, by definition, if you look it up in the Webster Dictionary, it says something like this. To cease or desist opposing uh, 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 the opposite force. Right? That kind of starting to make sense. He uses the word enemy, but God's not our enemy. So I've taken that out of context because it doesn't quite fit in this. But... It kind of does when you begin to look at it, who it is you're serving. Because if you're serving yourself or you're serving men, you are known as an enemy to God. And that's not what he wants. Stop opposing the opposition. So I want to show you, I want to show you another picture. Now, this is, this is surrender. When you, when you surrender your life, it is only for your gain. When you surrender something to God that His Holy Spirit is asking you to do, it's only so that, that chains can be broke free. How, how many of you guys like that right there? When I see that picture, I think to myself, I was once a captive and now I am free. Amen? I, I've lived in bondage. I've lived under depression. Who was it that said, I don't want to be depressed this year? The, the, the goal cannot be to be freed from depression. The goal can be, what is it that I can surrender so that Jesus Christ can begin the process in my life to free me from this place? If I were to ask you how many guys have negative thoughts and, 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 and thoughts about doing harm to yourself, it, it, almost every hand would go up because I understand it. Many of us wouldn't be bold enough to take the microphone and declare that publicly, and I get that, and I can respect that. But every one of us needs to understand that this is what surrender looks like. The Word of God says you've got to lose your own life. When I was a teenager, I, I heard a message one time. And it said, you, you've got to lose your life so that you will gain it. And it's contextual and it's the Word of God is what Jesus actually said. And He meant every word of it. But I thought, man, if I lose my life, that means... That I start to lose my identity. That, that could possibly mean that I may lose some of my friends. I may lose what it is that I have built my life upon. I may lose my clique that I'm running around with. I may begin to lose my personality. I, I may begin... No, 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 no. You are who you are because your Creator has, has made you. You will never live the life that you want to live under your own plan and your own purpose. It's only going to be satisfied, fulfilled, and found in content. I'm content with who I am. The only place that that's found. You know what that means when you have negative thoughts or you're dealing with depression? A lot of times that's another way for saying, Matthew, I haven't found my purpose yet. I have not only not found my purpose yet, I haven't found freedom in Christ yet. We understand that what we're trying to obtain is the same, but our goal is set in the wrong place. Surrender. That's why when you get saved and you walk out of here and you don't feel any different, you, you, haven't, you haven't surrendered. Tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. I, I told you it, it, it's, it's going to be really, really short. But this last part is, is very important. This is my bag. I got this bag from my house. I've taken this bag all over the world with me. It's been to many different continents. It's done many different things. This is my bag. My dad gave me this bag. And there's a lot in this bag. And it is heavy. In this bag, this represents my life. You guys understand? This is a representation of my life. And in my life as well as your life, you can put a lot of stuff in there. It can be experiences and it can be situations. It can be things that you want to hold on to and things that you wish you could let go of, but it's in your back. It's been placed there. It's either been placed there by your own action or it's been placed there by other people who did things to you. But there's a lot of things in here. In my bag, i got all kinds of crazy things. I've got bad relationships in here. Real, real bad. 
I, I've, got, I've got things in here I'm not, I'm not proud of. We all do. Amen? Every one of us do. i got things in here that I wish I could not remember. But they're in here and I, I remember it. I've got things in here that says, Matthew, God can never use you. He can never use you because of who you are and because of where you come from. He can never use you because of what your thoughts are telling you. Is this, is this ringing a bell? I, these are in my bag. This is, this is my life that I represent. Right? This is, this is what we do. And I want you to understand this because teenagers, I, 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 as, a, as a pastor, which by the way, I'm not a pastor. I am your pastor. I, I'm not a pastor to any adult out there. I am your pastor. So in this appointed time and place, you have a pastor. Matter of fact, you have two of them. My wife is a pastor. And when we say we have your back, and when we say we pray over you and we pray for you, and when we say we try to listen to God so that we can put good advice in your hands and we can direct you in good steps, that's what we do. You're not walk, walking around aimlessly around the town of Elton or Versailles or Osage Beach helpless. Why? Because we have resources and we know the source. So here's the deal. In this bag, I have a lot more stuff in here. But the thing is, I've put way too much stuff in here for me to carry. Matter of fact, right now in this moment, I have to carry this no matter where I go. It's become a part of me and I'm attached to it. And for some of us, we've gotten so attached to things that we shouldn't be that there's almost a comfort and a fear that if we let it go, we cannot set, be separated from it. That doesn't make sense to everybody, but that'll make sense to somebody that's dealing with some things. And so what we do is we come to this altar and I'm going to say, do you want to give your heart to the Lord? It's a, that moment is incredible. But it's not the goal. That moment is not the catch-all, fix-all. That's the beginning of a process that God is wanting to lead you in. You see the difference? Many of you guys have gotten so discouraged and so hurt and so let down. Because you thought the moment that you give your heart to the Lord, everything would be different and everything would change. And you never did that. You skipped the most important step after giving your heart to the Lord. You didn't surrender. How, how would it look like? Well, I can demonstrate it for you. I come to the altar. I've given my heart to the Lord. I've prayed the prayer. I've had people pray over me. I set, I set the, the bag down. This is my life, right? And before my tailbone hits the door, I come back in and say, man, I, I, I have... I forgot something. I forgot me. And I come back and I lift up my bag and I leave. Does, does everybody understand that this does not work? You can give your heart to the Lord. You can pick up everything that you had before and you continue to live from everything that you had before. There is no change there. Once again. I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm not saying that you have not been forgiven. I'm not saying that you're not going to heaven. I believe all those things. But I am saying there is no victory in this life. There's none. I am saying if you continue to live this way, you will continue to get what you have always gotten because you continue to do what you have always done. That's, that's simple talk. I'm going to get this even more simpler because, man, for some of us, the overwhelming thought of being transformed in a minute's notice is overwhelming. Matter of fact, it's unbelievable because it doesn't happen. A transformation of God is a process. And we're just beginning it. Salvation happens in an instant. You see the difference? This is what God has, has kind of spoken to me about tonight. I, uh, I told you I've got a lot of things in here. And sometimes... There's, there's freedom when you, when you create space, right? So I cannot continue to go out there and do everything that I've always done and expect God to be able to move and create and begin to heal and begin to do His work. Why? Because I'm trying to do everything that I've always done before. It doesn't work that way. I don't squeeze my God into an already filled life. I'm going to make space for Him. How I make space for Him is there's some things I have to surrender and I don't know everybody's situation. And so if I'm using personal examples, it's, it's not because I know things about you. It's because I know me. And I'm a person. And you guys are people. 
And I'm no more significant or better than anybody else here. And so, a few years ago, I dealt with something. And if I can find it, oh, I found it. I found it. That's right, it's heavy. She's heavy. Right there. That's a, that's a dumbbell for those who go to the gym. You know, if you don't, that's fine. I, I haven't touched that in six years. No big deal. It's, it's right there. I, uh, this in my life is a heavy weight. I, I don't want to carry this around, but I did carry it around for a long time. Far too long. And for me, my process of allowing Christ to do inside of me what I needed to be done, it came to a screeching halt the moment that I decided not to forgive. I carried around in my bag unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a bitter root. Starts off small, it grows big, and it entangles and encapsulates every part of your life. You ever seen a root kind of grow over things and around things? It's incredible what it'll do. And unforgiveness has done that in my life. For some of you guys, it's man, you, you've had so many things spoken or done to you in your life, you don't feel like you can ever get what you haven't already received. And that's why I told you to look at your neighbor and say, my life will end well. Aren't you glad that I'm going to receive more than I've ever had because Christ has done more than anybody can ever do in my life? My life is going to end well. You guys' life has the opportunity to end well if you're willing to surrender. Now say, Matthew, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what to, to surrender. Well, well, I don't either, but the Holy Spirit can speak that into your life. So for me, I knew that when I went to the altar and when I began to pray and when I began to, to try to reach the goals that I had set before me, I couldn't ever get past the weight that I had placed in my life because I kept holding on to it. I wasn't going to let it go. I couldn't let it go because it was so entangled in my life. Every time I got up from the altar, I took it, I put it back in my bag, and I left. And I did not surrender. So the process that Jesus Christ was trying to do inside of me, it never could grow fruit. It could never blossom. It had no growth at all. I want to make this, I want to make this very, very clear, but very encouraging now. I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. This, this will never happen. You will never go to the altar, <coughs> drop your whole self and your whole life, and leave this place just like this. It doesn't happen that way. Why? Because it's a process, right? I don't want there to be people in this room tonight that are so discouraged because they still continue to have the same thoughts. They still live in under the same battle. There is chains that have not been broken. Guess what? There's a whole lot more weights in this bag that I have not dealt with up until this point. But the Holy Spirit said, you've got to let this one go. Before the process can continue, you've got to let unforgiveness. You have got to forgive those who have done you wrong or you cannot continue the process. As a God, they don't deserve it. They deserve so much worse. They deserve worse. He says, no. The same way that you forgive, you will be forgiven. Ouch. Ouch. When I stand before God, I want to receive as much forgiveness as I possibly can because I need it. Amen? Amen. I'm concentrating on this tonight. But this could absolutely be another ugly word because this could also be called unloved and unvalued. And you can walk around in Eldon and you can walk around in the middle school or in the high school and feel neglected and overlooked. Never invited to the party. Never called out on in class like you may know the answer. Never appreciated for a hidden talent that you haven't allowed to be exposed. Always to be forgotten. Always to be last chosen. And if you live enough years like that, this is something that can grow heavy in your back. And so when you have opportunities, you withdraw rather than approach forward because life has taught you the moment that you let yourself out and go forward is the moment you get hammered back down and put back into your place. For some of you tonight, God needs to, and His Holy Spirit, I believe, is trying to speak to you and you say, you are my precious prize. You are my child. And where you are not where you are now is not where you will always be. Why? Because I'm going to end well.
Amen.